Very glad to be joined here today by Lucrezia Reichlin and Richard Barker. Lucrezia is with the London Business School, but she's also a trustee of the IFRS Foundation. Richard Barker is my colleague, is a fellow board member on the International Sustainability Standards Board. And this is the second in a four lecture series. The third will be taken by Richard, which is on Monday. And on Tuesday, we'll hear from practitioners in the field. I'll touch on that briefly on the slides. So welcome everyone today. I'm going to be taking today's session and um, trying to build in some of your last sets of questions into this. And off we go. I'm going to project my slides now. Hoping everybody can see the slides. Let us commence. So really, I'm going to talk about the ISSB, but I'm going to look at it from an overview, S1 and S2 perspective. Um, Lucrezia Le Le talked about standards and why standards are important. Talked about the risks that are engaged. And I'm going to try and deep dive with a little bit more of, more of an Africa perspective. I'll do a very high level summary. I think that's just three slides on S1 and S2. Don't worry about that because you're going to get a deep dive from Richard in the next session on Monday. I'm gonna explain why ISSP serves Africa, Africa specific risks, I'm going to play with the idea of Africa leapfrogging at this time and Africa's leap, le um, leadership prospects and some of the things that have happened. In these slides, for those of you who were not here the last time, we really talked about why the ISSP and that it was established as a result of high market demand in order to end the alphabet super voluntary standards. This is a bit of a trajectory of where we've come to since 2021 at COP26 when the ISSB was created. We're now working towards COP28 where we will be announcing a lot of the capacity building and the knowledge hub that we've developed since then. And we will also probably have um, a number of organizations essentially embracing the ISSB as the climate global baseline. Now that's really important and I'll speak about it um, later, but essentially it tells you the story of since our birth at COP26 and the creation of the first full board um, in December last year, we've issued the IFRS standards in June this year and a lot has happened since then. How did the standards evolved, it evolve? It was a very consultative process. And that consultative process, very, very important that African voices really keyed in. And as a result of that, we have a lot of proportionality mechanisms built into the standards so that they're applicable for larger and also smaller entities, but also interoperability, obviously at jurisdictional level is very key. Um, we touched on this yesterday, um, and I'm just bringing it back in now to remind you that beyond the standards issuance, the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures was handed over to ISSB to continue to monitor. And also IOSCO's endorsement meant that 130 jurisdictions are essentially looking to adopt these standards. And you're now looking at the European Commission on the 31st of July, having indicated there's a high degree of alignment, which increases the, the possibility that different jurisdictions can use these standards and still comply with um, other uh, jurisdictions. So this is really IFRS S1 at a high level. This is what Richard's gonna speak about in on Monday. It's the general requirements for disclosure. The IFRS S2 really focuses specifically on climate, but material information about climate related risks. And like S1, it also focuses on industry specific disclosures. What we're focused on is not just governance, strategy, risk management targets and metrics, but also allowing a company to tell its story in terms of adapting its business planning, its business model and operations. And also because we require scope three involving also the company's value chain. This is really a very high level image that reminds you that it's about connecting financial statements to sustainability related disclosures so that you have one set of results 
at the same time you can see your financial statements and your sustainability disclosures and you get granular in terms of how to treat those with the accounting standards and the sustainability disclosure standards side by side. Um, shared concepts that are very, very important is the concept of materiality. And now as we move into the Africa region, which is where I'm going to focus my attention on next, this question of materiality is absolutely key because we will find very soon that data is an issue. And so in order to ensure that we're able to give many African jurisdictions the chance to actually present their records in such a manner that investors are able to get past the very high perception of risk in African countries, it's very important to have material information that is relevant to investors and that investors require in order to enable decision-making. And this is part of the challenge that the ISSB is born to address. So one very important piece is that it's about creating a coherent reporting package where sustainability-related disclosures are released at the same time as the financial statements. And in this context, because of the fact that the ISSB is a global baseline, as we will learn in the session on Tuesday, African countries retain their sovereignty of ultimate reporting location and additional specifications. And that's what we will discuss on the Tuesday session. Um, I've just put up here um, an overview of who will be on that session. So we've just chosen three key countries, Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa, a makers and um, regulators who essentially will be dialoguing on how they have and how they are embracing the ISSB standards in their jurisdictions. So key milestones in Africa. Really the Africa journey started in September, 2022, shortly after the board was sat for the first summer just before COP26, when the African ministers of finance, economy and environment issued a communique to support the work of the ISSB to introduce a global baseline of sustainability disclosures and urged us specifically to provide strong advisory and capacity building support to achieve early adoption of the ISSB standards in Africa. And you will see later that this had a significant influence on the work that we do. Now, how does the ISSB serve Africa? First of all, what's really important is a mechanism or a standard to enable the develop on guide and inspire the development of processes, both data collection management, but also audit and assurance, so that there is cost-effective decision useful data for capital markets and investors. Now, this question of data, which is what these three points speak to, are particularly important questions for the African continent, because that data actually helps to unlock and provide comparability across industries and also across markets and is what also helps to unlock um, capital flows, which is the reason why proportionality in these standards is so key because it allows for the standards to be used in accordance with the preparedness or the availability of resources and, and um, the, the skills and the capabilities specifically called out in these standards. And also all of that without undue cost and effort, which is a methodology and a concept that we borrowed from the international accounting standards. Now I added this photo in today. In fact, this photo was taken just a few moments ago. And who you see is a number of the stock exchanges, Rwanda, Nairobi, um, uh, Ghana, um, Botswana, who's also the president of the um, African Securities Exchange. And what he's reading is he's reading the declaration that's going to be made at COP28, when we've had a huge discussion over the last couple of days as to why should Africa be adopting these standards and how exactly does it serve the African continent? in order to, to adopt these standards to unlock capital flow. So this is a big deal that happened today. And, and here's one of the reasons why. So first of all, in terms of impact of climate, 
So here it says half of the 10 countries most affected by extreme weather in 2019 are in Africa. More updated stats are that the of the top 10 countries most affected by climate, seven of them are African countries. And yet on the other hand, in terms of evaluating how exactly um, the, the, the impact is and what the data is, you'll see that there's much less data at the moment, um, or rather there's still a lot of patchy data on the different African countries, more sophisticated on the South Africa, Kenya, Mauritius end, according to this graph, but later on you will see that that's not always the case. A second reason why it's so important is because it has a secondary effect on supply chain and jobs. And you can see also that those um, entities, those departments or functions that are most job creating, um, other than government and social services, are agriculture, retail, hospitality, manufacturing, construction, all of which are significantly impacted by climate risk. So when you're talking about um, linking capital flows to African markets, you need to think about also what are the climate related risks and opportunities that could negatively impact that and how do you make sure that you're capturing them. Another interesting statistic there is that you will see that in many other parts of the world, institutional investors are the largest investors. But if you look at this graph, which I got from the OECD, first of all, Africa is somewhere under others. And you can see that others have only 5% of institutional investors. So there's actually a lot of work to be done in terms of deepening global um, capital markets. And this last point I thought was interesting was in terms of actually, you know, what are the headline figures for sustainable investing assets? This graph I suspect is going to change significantly in the next years, but you can see that negative screening, which is screening out those that who do not have the appropriate data is still significantly high. Now, just putting the African capital flows in context, what I like to remind us is that remittances actually are the fastest growing inflows into the continent at the moment. So they should not be discounted. And on the other hand, foreign direct investment is expected to surpass Asia and the Latin American countries in the next 20 years. And so that's, a, that's kind of a projection, again, drawn from World Bank and UNCTAD, but we have to work towards that. And what are the risks that are involved in terms of what are the things that could mitigate or not mitigate are being able to achieve some of these objectives of increasing capital flows? One of them is access to robust data. And another one is really the fact that we have lower rankings and scores by rating agencies precisely because of inadequate data. And this data gap needs to be closed and is actually one of the key requirements that the standards help to bring about in the sense that having the truly global baseline, one baseline that is very geared towards investors and capital markets and is very focused and centered as you will learn in the next section um, on material information that help to address and identify the sustainability related or climate specific related risks and opportunities that can affect and impact a company's prospects means that we're helping to target the data and the information that is collected in order to provide decision useful information to investors. It's not just that the data is key, what's also very important is to make sure that the third party, party assured data is key. Again, something that you will learn is that the IAASB is actually using the ISSB um, standards to help to create the criteria for assurance. And assurance is absolutely key in terms of making sure that we're not dealing with greenwashing and there's actually high credibility in this data. And that then helps us to address, especially from an Africa-specific um, perspective, taking down that high risk perception, which often comes through in the ranking by rating agencies, which is partly due to poor data and reporting. So in other words, if we can address the indirect linkage between sustainability disclosures and capital flows and see that actually being able to improve data provision and collection, then it actually helps to build that narrative 
that we hear very often, but is not often substantiated at the individual corporate level, that Africa contributes just 3% of global emissions. That's a significantly lower or low proportion of the global emissions that we're trying to address in our race towards net zero. And yet on the other hand, it also only attracts about 3% of climate finance. So there is a huge lacuna, or I would call it an opportunity in between, because actually it means that the African continent is a carbon sink and therefore should be, um, I don't want to use the word re rewarded, but there are conversations that have been taking place over the last two days in terms of leveraging technology, algorithms, and ratings that truly are looking at the nuances of the African continent to ensure that we are linking the provision of high quality data that identifies the material risks and opportunities, opportunities like carbon credits, the carbon sinks, carbon pricing, to unlocking capital flows. Now, I pulled this information, I took this from Risk Insights, simply because I wanted to give an idea of the kind of data. So the South African market was the first, really, to begin to start this work on data, on, for example, energy consumption, renewable energy per sector, water consumption per sector, total waste, waste recycled, and CO2 emissions. And you can see it's not perfect. You can see that there are certain um, industries that are really not reporting very much, oil and gas being one, but it's on the way. And the markets that have started later, if you would like to look at that, so this is scope one, scope two, and scope three. Later markets, for example, Nairobi, you can see that the data that is being perhaps collected individually, but not pooled publicly. So there is a dearth of data. So here we're on Botswana, um, here we are on Nigeria, and here we are on Mauritius, and then finally this is Ghana. So the point is in terms of addressing the data gaps, this is a huge opportunity for Africa actually to begin to leapfrog and actually own the narrative. I'm seeing that there is a message in the chat. I just want to make sure that it's not for me. No, it isn't. Right. So let's carry on. So what about adoption? Adoption of the ISSB standards in Nigeria. I've highlighted here the four countries that have taken the lead. They're not the only countries, but these are countries where Nigeria has, for example, as you will hear on Tuesday, changed their legislature in order to adopt and has declared, was the first to declare the intention to adopt the ISSB standards. Ghana and Zimbabwe essentially already have within their regulatory mandates, the mandate to oversee both financial standards and sustainability standards. And Kenya is working on them in Nairobi right now. I'll be meeting with the CMA um, later on this evening, in fact, immediately when this is over. And um, there are conversations ongoing here. Yesterday, I presented at the ISPAC forum. ISPAC is the regulator. And of course, um, at the forum today with the exchange, and they're all actively engaging in terms of how do we take the momentum of the ISSB standards, use the opportunity of better data, better information for investment decisions to attract the capital flows that are required to lean in on transition plans and avoid the screening out scenario um, that, that is a potential risk. Now, in terms of global adoption, I've just listed a number. You can see that of the jurisdictions on the adoption journey, and here I've added in, I should have added in Mauritius as well, because they're also in dialogue, and South Africa also. Um, I'll be heading there from here. We will have a, a regulators roundtable um, next week. So there's there's a lot of engagement Africa is very, very much as engaged on this as other jurisdictions and is seizing this momentum. So there's increasing uptake. Um, we are planning to sign, uh, I, I think I can say that even though it hasn't been signed yet, 
um, let, uh, letters of intent or MOUs with the African Development Bank, with the African Forum of Independent um, Accounting and Audit Regulators, with the Pan-African Federation of um, Accountants. Um, so there are a number of, of Pan-Africans and now we're in dialogue with ASEA, which is the um, African Securities Exchanges, um, there are 25 of them. So the, the and, and one of the things that we're also gonna be talking about is, and it's a question that I ask, how does digital reporting, because we will, and I'm sure Richard will touch on this, we are publishing an ISSB digital taxonomy at the same time as we're releasing the standards. Why is that important? Because it helps investors consume sustainability related information digitally. It also helps the regulators. And in this instance, in the, in the case of Africa, as we learned two days ago in South Africa, when we had a convening of regulators, it actually also helps with the financial statements, not just the sustainability related financial information. So again, that's a leapfrog opportunity whereby the taxonomy and leveraging appropriate techno technology in that regard and making the financial statements with the sustainability disclosures machine readable means that we're better able to assess. And of course, we know that data is very important, even just for the internal risk management and strategy and projections and planning and enabling business resilience, but of course also externally for um, investors. And so preparers would be enabled to implement digital reporting and the whole idea that we're working on at the moment, bringing these different African regulators together is the question is how do we achieve building the relevant infrastructure and enabling digital tagging without undue cost. To what extent, just like you have the free trade agreement um, across um, African countries, what we're noticing in this regard is there is a lot of collaboration, whether among the exchanges or the regulators, or in this instance, also the, the, the digital um, taggers to make sure that we're getting feedback. I was initially worried that Africa wouldn't engage as much because the digital taxonomy can be very heavy and can be quite difficult to comprehend even just as a concept. But honestly, on all the RFIs that we've done, I was very proud about the fact that Africa contributed 14% of the comment letters in terms of giving feedback. And that again, had an impact in the sense that First of all, in terms of understanding why digital reporting is important for Africa, we're looking at things like reducing the cost of capital, assisting regulators in oversight activities, facilitating the real-time use of innovation, of, of information to foster innovation, addressing that availability and accessibility of data issue. So there are a whole range of reasons why, but the main message and one of the key takeouts of Africa really engaging is the main message that we received from that consultation is that stakeholders supported the aim to start simple. That is to help with the global applicability of the taxonomy, but also make sure that in countries where digital reporting is not currently implemented and to simplify tagging by preparers, we keep that door open. Now, if Africa wasn't engaging, it's very possible that that would not be um, a major message that was heard. In terms of leadership prospects, what I wanted to talk through is I wanted to flag um, Nigeria in particular and just draw the parallel between 2012. Nigeria was one of the first countries to launch sustainable banking principles because it understood the connection between sustainability and capital flows. Um, and yet, if you see that in that timeline, for 10 years, so NGX released the sustainability disclosure guidelines in 2019. I know this because I was the group chief sustainability and governance officer at Dangote, which was the largest listed, so Dangote Cement, where we started with the reporting, was the most significant listing on the stock exchange at that time. And what was very important to me is, again, just like I encourage with the ISSB standards, I wanted to make sure that we released our sustainability report in compliance with the stock exchange requirements one year ahead of time. So we would have another year 
to learn and, and correct and, and improve and enhance. Because the first time of doing anything is always hard. So again, the same thing across these different African jurisdictions, the regulators are going to be encouraging voluntary use of the standards or permitting the use of the standards. And they're very, very broadly engaging. So Nigeria, for example, you see that one of the things that it did in 2023 was it created an adoption readiness working group which is now serving as a best practice model for other jurisdictions, where it brings together all of the regulators, a number of the key preparers, two of whom are now also on the um, implementation, transition implementation group of the IFRS. If the FRCN had not started early enough, these two organizations, namely MTN and Dangote, would not have applied for and felt ready or prepared to participate in the IFRS Transition Implementation Group. I'll show you a few slides of that later, but it's a very important voice that we listen to in terms of how are the ISSB standards being implemented? Where are the hitches? Where can we do better? Where do we need to publish additional guidance? Um, and, and you know, generally, how is the market receiving the work that we're doing? But the Adoption Readiness Working Group, which is being replicated in, in Zimbabwe, Kenya, Ghana, and South Africa at the moment, brings together the key regulators, the exchanges in the country, the preparers, um, and the, the Financial Regulatory Council to make sure, and of course the ISSB is in and out of that, to make sure that essentially whatever the regulator puts out has been discussed internally so that it really also works towards reducing the cost and burden of reporting and also ensuring that the effects of establishing the ISSB standards as the baseline for that country also has positive effects in terms of identifying and also mitigating risks and opportunities, but more importantly, unlocking the capital flows that are required to invest in the transition plans, whether that is working towards a net zero target or other sustainability or climate related targets that are set. So um, Nigeria is of course also represented on the IFRS taxonomy consultative group um, which is helping to define and refine the digital tagging or the digital taxonomy of the IFRS. So just to give you an example of how the FRCN, which was the first, which is the next slide, I believe, the FRCN announced at COP27 that Nigeria will early adopt the ISSB standards. And the reason why it said so is because it wanted to help to shape these standards. And all of these regulators that I've mentioned, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Ghana, Kenya, South Africa, one of the things they take pride at is they say that the way that we are engaged with the ISSB and the way that the ISSB's consultative process runs, we become standard setters, not standard takers. And so the reason why interoperability also for the ISSB standards is so absolutely key is because while Europe is setting its own regional standards, the ISSB is working on a navigational tool so that even if you're an African entity and you are trading with Europe or perhaps even listed with Europe, the interoperability between, and I think I haven't put that slide in here, I'm sure that Mike um, Richard will talk about it, the um, alignment between the European standards and the international sustainability standards is extremely high so that you can incrementally navigate from an implementation of the ISSB standards to comply with Europe, for example, on climate. And this is a lot of the work that we have done behind the scenes to make sure that there is a reduced cost and burden of reporting on preparers. It's part of the duty and obligation that we have in setting and fulfilling our mandate to establish a truly global baseline. Now, one of the correlations I wanted to draw was Nigeria put its hand up at COP27 and indicated that they would be implementing. And remember in September, 2022, the African finance ministers encouraged jurisdictions to adopt the ISSB standards and called on the ISSB to prioritize advisory support and capacity building, particularly to African countries. And it is one of the reasons why at COP27, what we prioritized as the ISSB was that we created a partnership 
of about 30 countries, including the Nigerian Ministry of Finance and the Pan-African Federation of Accountants to support capacity building. And at COP28, or at the latest at the AFDB annual meeting in 2024, the ISSB will also be signing with the African Development Bank a letter of intent to ensure that we're supporting African jurisdictions. So following Nigeria's first mover um, initiative to adopt the ISSB standards at COP27, other African countries, Kenya, Ghana, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Mauritius, Botswana, Rwanda, we've been in dialogue with all of them. And in fact, when the IFRS standards were launched, S1 and S2, which you will learn about in the next session, they were launched in seven countries globally. Of those seven, two of those countries were on the African continent, Nigeria and South Africa, and it was launched at the exchange. As a result of Africa's engagement, proportionality has become a key built-in feature of the ISSB standards. And also there are significant transitional reliefs that can be drawn on, especially to support smaller entities that are part of the global supply chains of larger entities. And then you have players like South Africa, who have recently led a Pan-African workshop to adopt the ISSB digital taxonomy, which is also a big step. Now, as I wrap up and round down so that we can have enough time for Q&A, um, I just wanted to highlight again also the impact, the transitional implementation group. You have two African members participating in that, but it's not just those two. You can actually make submissions all the time and also all of the board meetings of the ISSB are public meetings, and also the TIG is a public meeting. Proportionality, of course, is a key feature, as well as the transitional reliefs, the capacity building and the adoption guidance that is offered. Um, capacity building um, is absolutely key and continues to pervade everything that we do. In terms of closing out, why is it important and how exactly do we hope to mitigate um, the, the challenges that we're facing on the African continent in terms of not being able to attract enough capital to unlock capital flows. It's because of the decision usefulness of the information that will be provided and the fact that they can be delivered in a cost-effective way. To give you an example of the last time I was in Nairobi, it was actually on the invitation of Chairman Dow who oversees an association of a thousand Chinese companies that are operating on the African continent. And what they want to do is they want to voluntarily adopt the ISSB standards. And they are quite excited about the fact that many African jurisdictions are adopting these ISSB standards. So you can see, you already have a meeting between two worlds, Chinese investors and um, actors who are interested in working on the African continent in a socially, so they called it in a socially responsible way. And what they're trying to do is now migrate that from being socially responsible to actually adhering to specific climate related and sustainability related standards that are aligned with the jurisdictional requirements. Um, so making the ISSB standards the global baseline is absolutely key for us. And we do that by ensuring that there is a comprehensive global baseline. That's the reason why we've been working so hard on that. Of course, IOSCO endorsing the ISSB standards means that 130 securities and exchange commissions across the world in 130 countries have been encouraged to adopt these standards, which takes us a long way towards actually creating that baseline of consistent, comparable, and assured um, data so that you can compare across industries. What you'll learn also about in the next session is the industry specific standards, which are part of S1 and also part of S2. And the reason why they're so important and actually even serve as a proportionality measure is that if you're new to sustainability reporting, you can pick up the industry specific metrics and understand immediately at first glance what kind of metrics investors look at. But the point is that we need to keep this engagement going in order to shape these standards so that they continue to be Africa standards as well as global standards, one set of standards. Assurance is absolutely key. 
IASP, IASP is working on developing assurance standards, again, building on the ISSP standards. Um, obviously, African jurisdictions adopting these standards alongside many other jurisdictions across the world helps to create that comparability, but also um, collaboration. And finally, market participants. So at the launch in Nigeria, um, the entity that also, so we had Ghana come to Nigeria for the ISSB launch and get up on stage and say, we also intend to adopt these standards. And they followed through on that. Likewise, preparers got up on the stage. In this instance, it was MTN to indicate that they would be voluntarily adopting the standards even ahead of the standards becoming mandatory. And the fact that the standards are mandatory, it's a little bit like um, the IFRS accounting standards that are deployed across over 140 countries and across many or most African countries. What will happen now is you will have the sustainability related or climate related disclosures, risks and opportunities that are released at the same time as the financial statements. And so using a lot of the language and borrowing a lot from the accounting standards and written very much in similar form means that uh, all the finance professionals and accounting professionals suddenly have access and insight into sustainability related disclosures because it's written in a language that they understand. So it also expands significantly the ambient. Um, I end this presentation really with a few of the quotes of people who have um, endorsed the standards. For example, the International Organization of Securities Commission that um, endorsed just a few weeks after the standards were launched, which was a great and positive surprise for us. Um, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, um, which is speaking about the need for a common language to report and value climate and social sustainability strategies. So the concept of value creation is a very important part of these standards. Again, you will learn a lot about that. You will also learn a lot about how the integrated reporting, um, which has helped us describe sustainability on our side, um, is built into the standards. Um, the World Economic Forum, of course, and they refer specifically to the consistent and comparable sustainability information that empowers investors, particularly towards driving sustainable value creation. Um, the task force on climate related financial disclosures who pleasantly and graciously surprised us by shortly after the standards were launched and we built our standards on the four pillars of the TCFD framework which of course was launched by the Financial Stability Board. And the four pillars are governance, strategy, risk management, targets, and metrics. And shortly after the standards were launched, both standards building on those four pillars, the TCFD essentially handed over to us the TCFD framework to continue to monitor over time, which takes us one step closer towards reducing the alphabet soup of standards and creating one truly global baseline. And that's what you see written in this comment here, that the ISSB standards provide a global baseline for companies to disclose decision use for climate related financial information. And um, from the Asian Development Bank, and we have a similar um, quote actually from the African Development Bank, which I should have substituted, my apologies. Um, but again, here, it's really about enhancing whether it's Asian capital markets or African capital markets by attracting more investment and boosting private sector development. This is one of the reasons why we need this global baseline of sustainability related financial disclosures that the ISSB has been mandated to build. And lastly, from our own um, investor advisory group of the ISSB, we talk to the fact that high quality data is necessary to support capital formation and facilitate efficient capital markets. And so really what the ISSB standards will do or is designed to do is in communicating sustainability information to investors and other providers of capital. So in my concluding slide, what I just simply say is that really from an Africa point of view, because it is already stepping up to lead on this and because data is one of the key risks that we need to mitigate and address, but not just 
information, not just data, no, decision useful information that helps to unlock capital flows. And that is exactly what investors need in order to gain a better understanding of what the risk is for Africa and for African companies. So it's really important that we're able to provide more consistent, comparable, verifiable, and comprehensive disclosures to investors, but also internally for the companies. Remember I said that seven out of 10 countries most impacted by climate are African. So it's really important to take into cognizance the risks, but also the opportunities associated with climate or sustainability, broader sustainability issues in order to influence the governance, the strategy, the access to capital, the reputation and the stakeholder engagement of companies. And it's very important that this begins at the very highest level of governance. That is that boards actually get involved and that this is a process that is all across the organization as opposed to siloed in a single sustainability function. And overall, what this does, hopefully, um, if we're able to really build on this momentum and, and, and put our, our hands together as the African continent, preparers, regulators, capital markets, policymakers um, alike, um, is that this improved transparency about the sustainability related risks will ultimately contribute to long-term financial stability and sustainability because it has unlocked capital flows. So I hope that deep diving a little bit more into the um, standards and um, specific situation on the Nigerian continent, on the African continent, sorry, and countries like Nigeria who have stepped up to embrace these standards first has given a bit of an insight as to how standards actually help to mitigate risk, provide additional information and decision useful information to investors, unlock capital flows, and actually help to improve company prospects. Okay, so I guess the thing to do now is, I don't know whether we have started to respond. We have a number of questions here, um, and I guess we're going to take them from the top. How can, I'll try and bundle them though, in batches of three, right now we have 10. How can ISSB improve reporting by oil and gas or mining companies on sustainability targets beyond ESG compulsory reporting? Well, um, what the ISSB standards do is that they actually will create a mandatory global baseline of reporting standards that apply across a range of industries. And because we have adapted the SASB or internationalized the SASB standards, which covered 77 industries, oil and gas mining companies are one of those industries. And we've started with S2, which is focused specifically on climate. And of course, there will be other standards that will follow. We've just finished an agenda consultation asking on whether we should focus on human rights, human capital, biodiversity and ecosystems, or integration and reporting. And we're in the process, if you're going to be watching board meetings going forward, we're in the process of unpacking the feedback that we received. Offside question. I don't know whether offside means that I shouldn't be reading this question out. And if I am reading it out, I apologize. Um, but it seems like a harmless question. What impact do you see between good governance and the resurgence of coups and non-viable democratic institutions in Africa and the ability to dem domesticate these standards? I'm thinking of data integrity. Well, the thing that's interesting is that really the standards are anchored on capital markets, so very much private sector, and regulators, which are very much independent, actually, of politics. So um, governance, though, is absolutely key, not just governance, but also leadership and, and, of course, policy in that regard. But if your question is specifically around data integrity, then no matter what the governance structure is at a country level, businesses actually will only benefit from having integral and data that is 
verifiable and can be assured. But bear this in mind that there are two reasons why African companies don't do very well. And one of them is actually sovereign risk. So when sovereign risk perception is high, what happens is it creates a ceiling which African entities cannot go above. But then the other side of it is when you don't have data and people rank you down because you don't have data, that is within your control. And of course, data is of no value if it doesn't have integrity. So that's a great question. Next question, how can small and medium scale enterprises, which constitute a significant bulk of businesses in sub-Saharan Africa, be encouraged to adopt these standards? So one of the things that the standards require is scope three. And scope three essentially is the scope one of the smaller entities that are in the supply chain of the larger entities. So technically speaking, larger entities are going to have an interest. And I've already noticed that with a few um, actors where they are beginning to build capacity of their supply chains because otherwise they can't report scope three. So what I am since there was an offline question, I'll give you an offline answer to what I am secretly hoping is that there will be more collaboration between larger entities and smaller entities in the supply chain. And in fact, there will be much more visibility of the risks and opportunities. And in my last life, I did a lot of work at the base of the pyramid, connecting very large entities, large multinationals with supply chains and value chains at the base of the pyramid and the last mile. And I was able in some instances, for example, during COVID to establish that the multinational sales declined by 11%, but the last mile sales increased by 8% during that same time. So in other words, it actually also has the potential to unlock opportunities there. Um, another question, Amina, coming from a Nigerian perspective, I agree that gathering required data has always been a challenge. Most data used is based on what the federal government and its agencies release. Will you be relying solely on the federal government for the data or will, be, will there be other bodies you work with? So you see those examples that I gave, things I took from Risk Insights, um, that is data that is published. So when you're publishing your ISSB guided um, sustainability related disclosures or climate related disclosures alongside your financial statements, this data goes into the public sphere. So actually it is the data that comes from the companies that is then aggregated actually in something like uh, the, by somebody, someone like the National Bureau of Statistics in order to create current information. So the more data that there is from corporate entities, the more reliable the government's data is as opposed to vice versa. Where government data is very important is, for example, when you're coming across um, estimates, when you're trying to build estimates, um, which companies also can use as a means of um, short-circuiting the estimation for different elements of the disclosures. And there it is very important. And there actually there is the opportunity, I think, of being able to leverage emerging technologies and emerging models. But again, even in those models, we have to make sure that we build algorithms that take very real data from the Af uh, African continent in order to build realistic models that can churn out realistic estimates. So it's a very interesting question. Um, and there's definitely a lot of work to be done there, but there's also a lot of opportunity. So if this is an area that you're interested in, I think you should definitely um, put your head to the to the to the grindstone and build out this opportunity because with the on 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 unfurling on the and the adoption of these ISSB standards, it also unlocks the window for a lot of um, people who are involved in data, data analysis, AI, and otherwise. Mariam writes, will the early adoption of the standard make any difference where most of the inflows are from jurisdictions like China who did not endorse the ISSB standard? That's the reason why I was so excited about this invitation to come to Nairobi and participate in the China Africa Summit that was established here of a thousand Chinese companies that want to voluntarily adopt the ISSB standards and do so specifically for their investments 
in the African continent. So it just was a nice meeting of the minds to be in a country where um, you know the ISSB standards are being um, worked towards mandatory application and to be dealing with, obviously China is a significant investor um, on the African continent, to deal with a thousand Chinese companies who are interested in adopting the standards. That's the advantage of having a truly global baseline and a truly global baseline that has unfurled because of general popular demand and is a participatory process of being formed. I showed you the 1,400 comment letters that essentially helped to feed into the creation of S1 and S2 and that were global. Um, I mean, we have also a multi-location model. So we have offices in different jurisdictions and that is growing. And we have partnerships as well where we don't have offices. Um, and and that, that means that we are constantly on the ground and listening. Sandra says, what particular challenges exist regarding the implementation of IASB and ISSB standards? Um, I wouldn't say so much that there are challenges. Of course, there are challenges everywhere, but it depends on how you see things. There are huge opportunities in terms of synergies and connectivity between the IASB and ISSB. And we've really benefited, we have benefited a lot from the IASB, borrowing from, and of course, the former vice chair of the IASB is now a vice chair of the ISSB, and that really, really has helped us grow. And I think that in terms of the market, ensuring that we're um, encouraging sustainability-related and climate-related disclosures alongside the financial statements um, is a very important part. I'm looking at the list of questions and it looks like they've expanded significantly. Um, I'm at Samuel who's asked two questions. I know we're six minutes to the end. I'm looking at the chat, Diego, to find out when I should stop responding questions so that we can, we can wrap. Um, but there are two questions from Samuel, or no, one. He's just posted them twice. What is the comprehensive baseline for climate standards in the world? How are other African countries, specifically those who are not adhering to ISB, ISSB, work to, how can they work together with international boards to safeguard climate standards? Well, that's what we're trying to address. One global baseline that is applicable across the entire world and that is, however, a building block. And you will learn more about that on Monday so that there is a building block approach and you can take jurisdictional requirements and other um, standards and, and marry them with and use them alongside um, the ISSB. But at least the ISSB provides that one common global language and provides the standards that allow for decision useful information that investors can use simply because it's so important that capital flows follow the direction of travel of a transition plan, wherever that target is, whether it's net zero by 2050 or otherwise, it's very important to be able to unlock capital to follow um, the intention. I am at five minutes to close. I can keep responding to questions. I think we have, the last time I looked at the chat, it was 10. I actually thought I could do all 10. Um, one more question. So the question is, which which one? Which one? Um, let's just take the next one in the line. So after, to be fair, so after Samuel was Charles's question, with the new standards that have been issued, how can we approach the education of companies, stakeholders, with regards to understanding the data disclosed? This is other than regulators and reporters. That's a critical question. And it really speaks to capacity building, capacity building. So at COP28, we will launch the Knowledge Hub. I encourage you to go to the IFRS Foundation website. There's a lot of information that will be published and made available on the website. If you also pick up the standards, you'll see that there's a lot of illustrative examples and there's a lot of guidance that is used or can be used essentially to educate ourselves on these climate related and um, sustainability related disclosures that are being required of companies in order to enhance business resilience and unlock capital flows. And more importantly, in order to address the decision useful information requirements 
of investors and hopefully represent the risk profile of African companies more accurately than it currently is because the perception of risk on the African continent is often significantly higher than what the actual risk is. I think with that, we have three minutes to close. I've closed my Q&A chat box. I want to make sure that I introduce the next session that we will have. Um, the next session will be held by Richard Barker, who you saw at the beginning of this. He's a fellow colleague of the International Sustainability Standards Board, and that will be on Monday at the same time. And we will also then subsequently on the Tuesday, we will have a second set of series where we will have practitioners essentially in the room together with two um, of the IFRS Foundation trustees. Um, the lecture of today has been put into the chat and you'll also um, see the details of the session on Monday. And you can also see um, on the, the website, the lecture that we will have or uh, uh, that we had yesterday. And in the chat, you also will see the Tuesday lecture, 28th of November, which is more of the practitioner's lecture. I'm trying to find out where the time is. And um, I just want to thank you all very much for listening. Um, thank you for giving us of your valuable time. It's been a great pleasure to be here. And we hope we were able to provide some insights and um, some learning that will help you along your way.